Do you want to do the honors and reveal the secret new product launch for Frank? Sure. So very soon we're going to be launching a new product, an offshore RAND-based product, which is the Signia ITRIX S&P 500 ETF. South Africa is a small country, small economy. The investable assets of South Africa versus the rest of the world is very small. If you only limit your investments to South Africa, you're not getting access to that the 99% that's uh, that's left to externalize money. It's just in the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, it's become more viable to do it legally. So I was going to get you for that. Well, I mean, the million rand that you would have sent is no questions asked. So they, I mean, they're not going to, I mean, they can't really do anything to you then. What does it actually mean to invest offshore? It just means that you're investing in assets that have a jurisdiction that is different to your own. What should they be careful of? What should they have in mind before they actually dive now into investing offshore? The one thing which you, which you didn't mention, but I'd like to mention now is... Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking, where we speak frankly about money and investing with a no jargon approach. My name is Cassidy Nudal. I'm the head of growth at Frank, an app that's making investing simple and accessible for everyone. If you like what you see or you hear, give us a like, leave us a comment or hit the subscribe button. And if you want to learn more about what we do, check out the description box below. So today's episode is all about explaining and unpacking an exciting new product launch at the Frank headquarters. With me today in the studio is none other than COO at Frank, Seb Patel. Welcome Seb, again. Thanks guys, no problem. Do you want to do the honors and reveal the secret new product launch for Frank? Sure. Yeah. I mean, for a long time at Frank, you know, it's all about simplicity. So we've only had the Alan Gray Money Market Fund and the Satrix 40, a local uh, index tracking fund. But we thought, you know, we always wanted to expand that out a bit. Um, so very soon we're going to be launching a new product, an offshore RAND based product, which is the um, Signia ITRIX S&P 500 ETF. Exciting. Awesome. So before we go too deep into that fund, because I know we want to know a lot more about that and we'll get into that a bit later, I think let's take a few steps back and talk broadly more about offshore investing. You know, what does it actually mean to invest offshore? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, investing offshore just means that you're investing in assets that have a jurisdiction that is different to your own, right? So we live in we live in South Africa. If you invest in local assets, that's investing locally. Mm -hmm. If you invest in assets that are uh, headquartered or listed in the US or Europe, then effectively you're investing offshore. Okay. And I mean, so just for, for context, we obviously survey our uh, customers a lot to understand, you know, how they're experiencing the app, if they have any feedback, what they'd like to see more of. Um, and now in our most recent surveys, 47% of our customers indicated that they wanted to see an offshore investing fund. And I think this also mirrors a lot of South African, uh, the, the, opinion of a lot of South Africans at the moment. So why is it a good idea as a South African to be investing offshore? South Africans, I mean, 47% is, is quite high. Um, and I think there's there's two reasons why people want to invest offshore. And the one is more like psychological and the one is more practical. I think uh, many South Africans are very pessimistic about the economy, the country, what the RAND's going to do, what the government's going to do with their money. Uh, so like people have always wanted to kind of like look to externalize yeah. uh, money. It's just in the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, it's become more viable to do it legally because, yeah, uh, with the monetary restrictions um, saw being imposed previously, it was very difficult to legally externalize money. Interesting. Now it's a lot. Now it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are a lot of practical benefits uh, from investing offshore. The one is, you know, South Africa is a small country, small economy. The investable assets of South Africa versus the rest of the world is very small. I think it's like one percent of investable assets are, are South African. So if you only limit your investments to South Africa, you, you know, you're not getting access to that the 99% that's, uh, that's left, I guess. Um, so exposing yourself to a lot more companies, a lot more uh, economies that might be offering, you know, different kinds of uh, things. Uh, currency diversification is another one. Um, yeah. And like, and it's also, it's, it's, it's a strange thing because even in the South African market, um, like the Satrix 40, even there, there's a lot of offshore businesses. It's just that they are listed in South Africa, so they don't qualify as offshore. So for example, like MTN, um, you've got MTN, which is a listed company, but underneath the MTN, you've got MTN South Africa, which is the South African business. You've got Nigeria, which is obviously an offshore revenue stream for that, for that company. But because the MTN is listed here, it doesn't count. Sa same goes like British American Tobacco, which is a huge business but listed in South Africa, 
So it's not doesn't really count as offshore, uh, even though you can buy you know cigarettes, Daniel and Rothmans or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it counts as a South African business, not offshore. Whereas like something like Apple, you can still buy iPhones here, yeah. but it's not listed here. It's listed in the states amongst others, so it counts as offshore. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then just for a, I guess a quick recap for our audience, if you could go over what diversification is and and why it's really important in in investing. Sure. So diversification just means that you don't put, to use an analogy, you don't put all your eggs in one basket uh, to, to to limit your risk. Um, so like if you have a diversified investment portfolio, what that means is that you've invested in a few different types of things, yeah. uh, whether that's different asset classes, uh, so like cash, shares, bonds, property. So then you diversify across asset classes or you could diversify within an asset class. So instead of just holding one share, instead of just holding Sassol, for example, you hold a diversified range of shares, um, so Sassel, Standard Bank, Woolworths. You know, those are three businesses that operate in three different industries. So, if something happens with the oil price, which might impact Sassel, maybe it doesn't impact Woolworths as much. For example, in this context, it's essentially instead of only investing in South Africa, you're investing in other markets, and that's your diversification. Correct. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so then going practically, how does one actually invest offshore? I know there are two different ways that you can invest offshore. Is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, you can invest directly offshore, um, which means that you effectively need to convert your your rands into a foreign currency. Uh, so let's use dollars. So you use, you've got you know uh, a certain amount of rands you want to invest it offshore. You need to convert that into into dollars. Move those dollars into an uh, offshore investment account, um, and then you know those dollars buy you a product that's uh, domiciled uh, in the US, for for example. Um, those products, uh, sometimes I've got high minimums, uh, so $10,000, 20000 50000 You can maybe get some that are uh, slightly smaller, but generally they, you, know, you need quite a bit of money to, to get started. Um, you also, like when you convert your, your rands to the, to the foreign currency, um, there's some costs involved because uh, you know the forex dealer needs to make some money. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's a cost. There's a cost there. Um, when you invest, gen- generally, like upfront investment, there won't be a cost, but there'll be an uh, asset management fee um, on that product. Um, and you're allowed to invest. We're allowed to externalize a million rand a mm-hmm. year with like kind of no questions asked. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's called your single discretionary allowance. And then on top of that, if you still want to move more money um, offshore, you can invest another 10 million rand on top of that a million rand. Uh, but then you need like a, a certificate from SARS to say that you're in good standing. Um, and if you are, then there shouldn't be any reason why you you know shouldn't get that. Um, so that's the first way. Okay. Um, the second way is where you can invest almost like indirectly. Um, so using your RANDs, um, you can invest in a product that's RAND based, but has exposure to offshore assets. Um, and there you don't use any of your um, allowance. Uh, you don't need permission or anything like that. Um, so, for example, the the Signia uh, product that we are about to offer, the Signia Itrix S and P five hundred, is an example of the latter, mm-hmm. where if you've got rands, you can invest in a in a rand based product that effectively then that fund will invest into um, into the S in, into the underlying assets that comprise the S and P five hundred. Um, so that can happen either directly or through like a feeder fund. And what a feeder fund means is that you're investing in a fund, which then its only asset is another fund. So for example, yeah, you, you invested in, in, in a fund that you can pay rands for, but then that fund uses the rands to buy um, units in a dollar-based fund, for example. That's, that's what's called a feeder fund. Um, yeah, so those, those are the two ways generally. And then for that second way, because you, you kind of covered the, the fees or the, the minimum deposit uh, in terms of the RAND denominated um, funds, uh, is, that, is there a minimum fee there or deposit, should I say rather? Yeah, some, sometimes there may be, but it'll be a lot lower than, than, the, than the direct. Um, so it could be, you know, 100 Rand, 500 Rand, 1000 Rand, uh, which is a lot more accessible than trying to, you know, 10,000. Trying to invest ten thousand dollars, for example, and then tax implications. I mean, especially when you're you're sending a million rand overseas. I'm, assu- I'm assuming <laughs> SARS is going to get you for that. Well, I mean, the million rand that you would have sent is no questions asked. So, they, I mean, they're not going to. I mean, they can't really do anything to you then. Uh, it's only if you start uh, making money off your investments that's when SARS, you know, um, wants to, you know, wants to get a piece of you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so for example, and there are tax differences between the two. Um, so whether you do it directly or indirectly, and it's mainly to do with uh, the devaluation of the currency. Uh, so to, to give you an example, um, let's say you, you use the, the RAND based uh, method and you, you put a hundred RAND into, into an offshore product. Um, and after a couple of years, that product is worth uh, 200 RAND or your investments worth 200 RAND. Um, you sell it, you make a hundred RAND profit. Um, you know, you could be liable for capital gains on that hundred RAND depending on, you know, how much capital gain you've made uh, okay. on your portfolio throughout the year. Uh, but that is your gain. It's a, it's a hundred mm -hmm. because you invested in RANDs. Um, to use another example, if you invested um, directly using, let's say, a dollars as an example, and when you invested, the dollar was at 10 Rand to the dollar. Let's, uh, let's take it back a few years. Um, I wish. So, so let's say you, you, you put a, you put in a hundred Rand, uh, you bought $10 worth of, uh, of whatever. Um, and then you sold it uh, a couple of years later. Um, and let's say the, what you pay $10 for is still worth $10. Um, but the Rand is now 20 Rand to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Um, your capital gain is actually zero because what you pay ten dollars, you sell it for ten dollars. It's actually a zero capital gain, even though you are still getting two hundred rand back for something that you paid a hundred rand for. Okay. Um, so in that scenario, it would be more beneficial to invest directly mm -hmm. um, because you actually just taxed on like the movement of your dollar investment. Uh, but you know, if the rand went the other way and strengthen, which it sometimes does, um, then you would have been better off doing it the indirect way. So, I mean, from a diversification perspective, is it a good idea to have both an offshore investment direct in, in, you know, in whatever market you're wanting to invest in and then a random nominated one as well? Yeah, I mean, you could. I think the, when you're looking at it, like which one should I do? I think unless you've got like a real sizable chunk to, to invest, you should just like do it locally. Mm -hmm. uh, so use the RAND based one. If you've got, you know, a few hundred thousand RAND and you say, okay, I want to actually externalize my money, then it makes more sense because of the costs involved and because of the, and because of the minimums. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you, if you just sort of like want to just get started, I would say just go for the, um, go for the RAND based one. Uh, that said, there are a lot more options that are like dollar based, euro based, pound based than there are offshore RAND based just because, um, yeah, there, there are a few unit trusts, there are a few ETFs, but, um, there's not that many, uh, but they're good enough to, to kind of get you going. Got you. So on that note, uh, it's obviously part of our, uh, approach to investing, to hand pick funds for the Frank app that are top performing low cost for our users and for our audience so that they don't have to be overwhelmed by all the choice of all the different funds out there. Right. So why the Signia fund? Why did we pick that one for the offshore uh, fund for for our frank investors. Sure, yeah. I mean, the the Signia product was, was one of the cheapest when we did our our research on it. Uh, it also had a zero percent um, annualized tracking error, and what that means is that it almost perfectly tracked the movement of the S and P five hundred. I mean, you might expect an index tracker to do it perfectly, but often you know there is some there's, there is some uh, misalignment of uh, the error as they, as they call it um, but yeah Signia seems to be do, doing a very good job in actually tracking it perfectly um, and I mean this product has been around for a long time uh, Signia uh, under their brand I think it's been going for seven years Signia is a well-known and reputable brand so yeah it kind of made sense okay got the Got the stamp of approval. Yeah. To, I guess, wrap up, if we were to talk about the guidelines for investing offshore, right? So our audience obviously now know what investing offshore is, how to do it, the two different ways. Um, what should they be careful of? What should they have in mind before they actually dive now into investing offshore? The one thing which we, which we didn't mention, but I'd like to mention now, is that often people want to start investing offshore when the RAND like tanks. Yeah. You know, so like the, let's say tomorrow the RAND goes to 25 to the dollar, then everyone's like, oh, the RAND is so bad. I'm going to move my money. But that's kind of the worst time to do it because when the RAND strengthens, then your, then your, your, your investment is devalued, right? So I think if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to invest offshore, like, um, don't try and time the markets. I mean, this applies to any kind of equity investment. Mm -hmm. Just, just invest, you know, what you can when you can. Uh, so if you're doing the RAND based one, invest every month so at least you're averaging into the market yeah. um 
and if you want to invest directly, just don't try and time it when the when the rand tanks because I mean maybe it'll get worse, but often it gets better, and then you know uh, you would have done badly. So I think yeah, you just need to you know figure out how much you have to invest, which of the ways it m- makes more sense for you. Is it the direct one? Is it the rand based one? What are the fees involved? Does it make sense like relative to um, which which way you're gonna go? Um, yeah, it you if you're investing in equities, it's a long term it's a long term play. It can be quite volatile. Um, we've seen the S and P 500 has grown like 35 percent so far this year, mainly off like very strong performance in the in the technology businesses that are there. Um, you know, Nvidia, Meta, etc. So those th- things could also drop. So you know, people just need to be aware that yeah, investing in the stock market um, yeah is for the long term. Yeah, you have to ride out the the fluctuations and make sure that you have a, a very patient outlook. Yeah. Then thank you so much for joining this episode of Frankly Speaking. We've loved having you. And if you enjoyed it, please give us a like, leave us a comment, or hit the subscribe button for future episodes. Until next time, cheers. Bye.